Hey, welcome to Overtime, where we take Sunday's message further. My name is Jeremy, and I'm your host. And this is a podcast where we just want to ask the questions that we think that you would ask as it relates to Sunday's message. And as we do so, we hope that it helps you grow in your life and your faith. With that being said, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you can stay up to date on all of the podcasts that are coming out. Not only that, hit the like button, because when you do so, it helps us help other people. And if you ever have a question about Sunday's content or about Overtime, you can submit those to overtime at npaustin.com, and we will be sure to get to those in future podcasts. So with that being said, here's a quick recap of Sunday, and then we're going to jump into our conversation today. The question that's kind of the theme for the whole series, why did Jesus come into the world in the first place? It is essential to know that what he claims about himself and what the Bible communicates is that he's 100% man and he's 100% God all the time. Why leave the perfection of heaven to come and have what is honestly a brutal human experience here? So the first would be to communicate his love for the world. We live in a culture that is totally lost the definition of love. What he writes is he says, this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. The second reason is to say he came to be an example for the world. Going back to John in one of his letters, John says, whoever claims to live in Jesus must live as Jesus did. And third, to show God to the world. Bottom line, he came because he loved. He showed us how to love. He pointed us to a God who is love. Well, now that Josh is finally ready. Yeah, yeah. Uh, always waiting on him. Yes. So um, I need you, on behalf of all the people who don't care uh, or haven't been updated on March Madness, oh, wow. um, okay. to give yeah. me an update on what's going on with March Madness. <laughs> so I, in my, and and I was, I had full <laughs> intentions of filling out a bracket. Being one of those guys super engaged, we actually had the idea to fill out a North Point bracket, uh-huh. like we would do it on the LED wall in the welcome. The timing uh, just didn't work out. Yeah. So like, first service would fill out half the bracket, second service, and then we would look at it like throughout and like wow. post it on. So, so we had this yeah. whole idea. It just didn't work out timing wise. Okay. And then I just missed the cutoff. I was mm. I was, I was in the car and I was missed the cutoff from. I was gonna say because your name mm. is in the North Point staff bracket. Uh huh. And it just says you have zero points. Yeah. And I was like, I, that's hard to do. <laughs> like that would be just, that would be harder to do, <laughs> I think, than a perfect bracket. Well, maybe the same hardness. In it my like, defense, I don't have a bracket. <laughs> <laughs> so. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. It says you're right there at the bottom. Number 11 of 11, zero points in every round so far. What's my name in Jay that? Jay Nettle in one. Jay Nettle in one. Jay Nettle in oh, one. Okay. Holiday Preacher is third. I'm, I'm in third place. That's you. Yeah, I don't know who this other person. I don't know who Code Force is. Code Force. It looks like Norcross is in first, which is kind of par for the course a little bit. No, somehow, he fantasy somehow that time. Canadian. How he how always does. Aggie Swish doing. Aggie Swish. Is that is Kelsey? That's me. Oh, that's you. <laughs> Heard of the Aggie Swish? Is you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. Eighth. They're eighth. Yeah, out of what, nine? <laughs> out of, uh, yeah, out of ten if you don't count. <laughs> yeah, I told you, I literally closed my eyes and picked them. So I <laughs> yeah. All right, yeah. so tell me, what's the latest March Madness? Have you heard about the 15 seed that is in the Sweet 16? I did, I Here's did. Here's an interesting stat for you. So uh, 15 seeds, there's something like 10 and 140, <laughs> like all time, right? Mm-hmm. Like 150 games played, they've lost 140 of them. They almost always lose their opening round game. Mm-hmm. But then like in the second round, they're like three and nine or something, or, th- or three and six, three and seven. No, they'd have to be mm. 10 of them, something like that. So in the second round, they're like way more successful because we've now had three 15 seeds make the Sweet 16. Which There's got to be a psychological study. Like, I think if you're labeled. Yeah, now you feel some pressure and you're un- like, yeah. you're playing the 15 seed who just won or, you yeah, know. Yeah, and know. then you're, yeah, it's interesting. And for the 15 seeds to go, oh, we're not like automatic losers. Like we belong in this tournament. Yeah. There's probably a different set of confidence that kicks in. Yeah. Yeah. Or they were misseeded to even win that first game. I don't know. But what's a bummer is that if Texas had won their round of 32 game against Purdue, they would have played the 15 seed. And the one and the two, so Baylor and Kentucky are already out of Texas's region. Mm -hmm. And if they had beat Purdue, that was the three. The four and the eight are playing each other in UCLA, North Carolina. So Texas had like a really sweet path to like 
Elite Eight or even Final Four type stuff if they wow. beat Purdue. Not that they blew it. I mean, Purdue's really good, but it, it was yeah. just like, oh, we had like we've been set up really well for it. So, anyways, that's happening. I don't know if you heard of Baylor had a twenty-five point comeback and then lost wow. in overtime. So oh, they were down twenty-five man. as the one seed to eight seed in North Carolina. Well, twenty-five point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's one of those games where those, I don't know. Yeah. Those players are probably really sad, but yeah. I would I would walk away from that game like, man, we really we we like gave it everything we had. Yeah. We didn't hold anything back. Right. None of them were thinking that. Yeah. <laughs> they were all Yeah, they're, they're all beating angry. themselves up. Yeah, so yeah. that's that's an interesting story, you know, kind of highlight in there. Uh Coach Shashevsky's in his last um, last year at Duke. Say so that five that, times fast. Well, yeah, and spell it ten times. It's like Mike <laughs> Kr- Krzyzewski. It like starts with a K. Coach yeah. K is Coach Shashevsky. Yeah. Tell me how that works out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, that's stuff. But anyway, so he... Uh, he, and he looks very happy every time they win right now. Looks like he's enjoying coaching, so it's good. Well, I love how much you love all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> for, for those of you who don't know. George, I don't have a five-month-old. So no, I that's true. And you. and you like sports. Uh, yeah, that's true. That but, helps uh, as well. For those of you who don't know, Jordan and I were roommates in college. <laughs> and uh, I that's when I actually started to like football, college football, NFL a little bit more. Yeah. Um, now, granted, I was that's in good. college going to the game, so it was ex- exciting. But uh, it was mainly because you fell asleep to Sports Center every single night. Mm. And we were in a little what I don't know, eight by ten dorm room. Yep. You know, I mean, Grant, it's America, but it was very small. It was yep. pretty small, um, yep. and we were you know sleeping right next to each other. Yep. And Sports Center, right? Always on. Yeah. Emily yep. has won that battle. We don't fall asleep to Sports Center, but you did not win that <laughs> battle. <laughs> <laughs> we fell asleep to Sports Center in yeah. college. Yeah, that's 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 very true. Yeah. But uh, yes, that's good. You are a sports guy. You grew up a sports guy. That is. I, thank you. I think I don't. Yeah. Know. <laughs> I think I appreciate that. Yeah. No, you're welcome. It's a big compliment for me. Uh, <laughs> so this past week, uh, we kicked off a new series called "Why Did Jesus mm-hmm. Fill in the Blank," and uh, really just trying to answer a lot of those "Why Did Jesus" questions. And a big one. I mean, especially. I mean, right now I've got my computer and I can just um, search. Uh, Google and one of the top ones that comes up is why did you know suggestions is why did Jesus come into the world Mm -hmm. you know Um, and and what does that look like and so that was obviously a way to kick off the series and really what we're going to be doing through this series is really going through a couple of these questions leading all the way up to Easter um, which you know all of these are going to kind of point to the Easter being like the culmination of um, Jesus being who he claimed to be in in his death and resurrection, proving that. And so um, you, I mean, briefly, I mean, I've got it in our notes here, but it's probably better if you just go through it. But briefly, like what um, what was kind of your bottom line for Sunday in terms of answering this question, why did Jesus come? And then we're going to unpack a couple more things about it. Yeah. So, yeah, we said we focus on this why question to kind of build that bridge of connection, right? That the more you know the why behind somebody's hearts, motives, actions, that's what builds relationship, mm-hmm. trust, connection, mm-hmm. empathy, um, or is potentially the reason you reject somebody as well when you right. discover why and you're like, that relationship's not for me. And so the bottom line we said was uh, that he came because he loved, showed us how to love and pointed us to a God who is love. That was my attempt to try to like put you know a statement together that was concise, um, recognizing that there's a lot of reasons that he came, and we'll talk about that you know for the rest of the series as well. Um, but trying to give an introductory to say like you know where's really the starting point if we're ending with his death and resurrection on Easter? What's what's the starting point? And we said it really it starts from an expression of love. And I really, I try to emphasize, 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 emphasize. Mm-hmm. That's a tougher word than I thought it was mm-hmm. going to be, as you, as you heard there. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that he, he didn't need that because he was like missing something or lonely. Right. It was because of the fact that he is love. The natural expression of that love was his, his coming to earth. And so. An action. Right. Yeah. So there's kind of three pillars where to communicate his love to the world. Um, we just talked about how, you know, physical presence, pursuit, um, sacrifice, time and Invested, all of that communicates love. Uh, and then additionally, I mean, the way that he lived his life for us and ultimately gave up his life for us. But that was one to be an example to the world. And we emphasize a lot. He, he is 100% God. He's also 100% human. Those two don't conflict with one another. And in his humanity, he was the perfect human. And he showed us what a sinless life looked like. And he showed us how to conduct ourselves, what perfect character looks like, what perfect love looks like, perfect in relationships, all of those things, how to connect with God, how to communicate with God. He was our perfect example. And ultimately, he came to glorify 
glorify God or to show God to the world. So we know what the Father is like because Jesus came. We know God's character. We know God's very words. Uh, and we have way more insight in, into the Father today because we have the life and the words mm-hmm. of Jesus available to us. So Yeah. So one of the things you said on and that was a great synopsis. Thank you. Um, one of the things you said on Sunday, you briefly mentioned that there were uh, you really had to boil it down to those kind of three reasons as to why Jesus came. But yep. um, Jesus made a lot of statements that were more than three statements. Like I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You know, like yeah. he made a lot of statements about why he came. Right. And so we've kind of boiled it into these three buckets per se. Yep. Um, but you said there were like. 31 mm-hmm. that, that you were like as in your discovery and research for this message like 31 reasons you could pull from scripture as to why jesus came into the world yeah um unpack some of those or we probably don't have time to go through all 31 but give some examples um talk about that a little bit yeah yeah so i think you know one of the more like straightforward ones that this would you know be pretty core but didn't have time to get to was he said, I, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So that's in John six thirty eight. He's like, I came to do the will of my father. Right. Mm-hmm. So part of that is, again, it, it goes back. We had this Trinity conversation to be like, wait, him, God, son, Trinity, and all that kind of stuff. He is God. So how does that work? But we're like, hey, there, there's one God, three persons. And so in that complexity, that is God. God, the son came to do the will of the father. And so part of that is like he's submitting to the will of his father. Um, I, I think one of the, the biggest to me is, is he said he came to seek and to save the lost, right? He's like, um, it's not the, not the sick or not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. Mm-hmm. And when I think about like a, a Luke 15 passage or something like that, um, uh, you know, th- which is the, the parable of the lost sheep, lost coin, prodigal son, basically in each of those, he tells a story where he's like, Hey, if, if something is lost of value to you, you do whatever it takes to go and find it and recover it and restore a relationship with it and right. so on. And that's the heart of the father. That's why I've come. And um, to me, that that was one where I'm like, man, I just wish I could have turned just that one into a whole message or sermon. Because um, that doesn't mean like some people are less than or something. That's all of us. Like, you know, he, mm-hmm. he came for all of us. Um, this is just something where some of us have become aware of our need for a savior and place our trust in him and so on. But he came on a, a rescue mission. Like he absolutely did. He came to, to live the life that we couldn't, um, to live a, a sinless life. And because he was fully God and fully man. He was the only one who could be that, that sacrifice for us. So, um, I think about that being, you know, one of the ones he said, I came to be a light, you know, I came to be the light of the world. And so, uh, like, what does that mean? It's like, well, he, he stood out. Um, he is the light in the way that he lived. He is the light. We talked about, you know, already his, his sinless, uh, nature, uh, light being the example, light being hope, um, light being the way forward, light being the way the world is going to be, you know, restored. Um, he said, I've come uh, to give eternal life. I'm looking at this whole, I, I opened that 31 reason doc when I was like, hey, there's 32 reasons. Yeah. Um, to bring great joy was one that was on the list. I thought I was like, man, that's great. Like when you think about Luke 10, the angels, like I bring you good news of great joy um, that will be for all people. Like Jesus mm-hmm. has come so that we might experience, you know, the fullness of life, the fullness of joy uh, and know what that is like because of him. Um, he also came to judge the world and we're going to talk more about, you know, sin as we get closer to Easter and why it is right. necessary that he would die and so on. But this is the truth side of the grace and truth statement that we looked at to be like, he, we know what truth is, um, not because it's, you know, subjective and we came up with it and there's my truth and there's your truth and there's, you know, um, but we know what truth is because he lived it because he spoke it because we have access to his words, to the scriptures. And so, um, as a result, we're able to have an awareness of what, is sin and he, and he calls out sin you know very specifically and very harshly um and also came to die for that sin that we might have forgiveness of sins yeah um let me ask you this as you're going through this list like which one of these um uh, this is more of a personal question which one of these like resonates for you the most right now like or, or maybe just even in your writing process and your prep process yeah, I think, well, the, the two most personal is like one, uh, the, if in one word, like the idea of with, like the idea of like he came be, to be with us, you know? Mm. Um, and so I know you might be like, well, we kind of talked about that on Sunday, but the idea of his personal nature that, that our greatest joy in life is to be with him, the personal experience of not just knowing facts about, but really knowing Jesus, like that was initiated and that understanding of God was made possible by Jesus 
coming to us, right? So yeah. um, that's one that resonates with me personally. I have a deep passion um, around the idea of like coming to seek and to save the lost. I have this, you know, passion around, okay, if heaven is for real, we're going to spend the rest of eternity knowing God more fully and growing and deepening in our relationship with him. Um, we have a very limited window here in which we have the opportunity to introduce people to Jesus, right? And so I feel not that God isn't sovereign. That's a whole different conversation, but I feel this deep responsibility to say, um, if we are not doing the same, if that's like why he came and we are the church, we're the body of Christ, like then, then that's our mission, you know, Mm -hmm. as well as to point Mm -hmm. people to him. Um, and so I have a very, um, a very deep passion around that as well. Um, those, those would be like the two probably that like, you know, come to the top of the list for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I could flip that question back on you as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think, oh man, golly. I, I would say, as I'm looking through this, um, yeah, I would say, I don't know, t- to bring peace is one that sticks out to me. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the one the one I'd reference, you know, and, and it's a, I'm in a LDG group and we have to memorize verses and stuff so that one came to mind right away because mm-hmm. we've it's been one of those verses we um i have come that they might have life and have it to the full mm-hmm. and have it to the full like everything and that's part of the series is we're focusing on the person of jesus and everything else in which we look to it in life to satisfy us is going to fall short mm. um there's a quote that says um the lo- <coughs> excuse me <laughs> the loneliest moment in life is that when you you kind of finally experience the ultimate and it lets you down mm-hmm. you know what i mean it's like i always think of like t- tom brady getting yeah. five rings and like i'm coming back yeah you know and it's like he's experienced it all yeah <coughs> same with like jim carrey he says you know i wish everybody could be become rich and famous so they'd realize it's not what life is about yeah you know what i mean i mean we are so um it, it, we are so often just searching for something to fulfill us. Right. And Jesus says, like, I've come that they may have life and have it to the full. Like, Jesus satisfies every desire of our heart mm. in a fullness of life. And mm. so, um, I've, I mean, that's, I'm, I've experienced that mo- in moments, and then I find myself searching again. Yeah. You know what I mean? And so I think for me, that's why I love this series. I love, you know, the idea that we're talking about it. So, but uh, uh, yeah, you're not supposed to ask the podcast questioner, so I'm gonna <laughs> I'm gonna cause we'll flip it back to you now. Um, you, one of the things you mentioned is it's really this series is about us kind of honing in on Jesus mm-hmm. and trying to uh, kind of decrease the noise around us. Yeah, and I think a lot of times people, both within the church and outside the church, tend to view Jesus through um, a foggy lens. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is like there's there's fog. In the way we view him, in our we're, we're bringing our biases, our past experiences, our past hurts mm-hmm. um, to the table, and we're, when we're trying to evaluate who Jesus is and what he said and how it impacts our life. Mm-hmm. And so, why why do you think there is so much fog? Why is there so much noise when it comes to us really trying to just center in on Christ? Mm. Well, I think there's, I think it's a multifaceted question right i mean there's things that naturally blind and fog us i think you know uh, like sin is a part of that we you know live in a broken world and have a broken perspective and have broken hearts and so it it messes with our ability to perceive you know what is true and what is good and what is right and so on um but i think you know the the most like natural is just in our our personal experiences um we naturally you know wait emotional experiences, um, bad church experiences or church hurt or a a Christian who hurt us, um, hypocrisy, you know, whatever it might be being lied to. Um, we, we take these experiences and we will, um, and it's, it's a logical like fallacy, but we'll project it on then the truth will connect that bad experience with our belief in the whole system, you know? Mm -hmm. And so there was, there was something wrong here. So it's all broke. It's all not true. I don't like this one, you know, facet. So I'm like walking away from it altogether. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that would be like one element, you know, another element might just be like kind of wanting to do what I want to do. And so like, I'm going to use noise as an excuse. And so I don't have to think about, you know, so I don't have to dive into so I can feel good about or sleep better at night, like not considering, you know, what is true. But for me, what I was like really trying to get to the bottom of on Sunday with that statement, you know, I kind of set it up front and then at the end as as well is like, it's not that 
Um, it's not especially, you know, bad church experiences. And some people have had some horrific ones because the church is made up of people, you know, and, 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 you know, church and churches have done horrific things and made, you know, total abuses of Jesus's words and were completely misaligned with his intentions and what he told us to do and so on. And when I say, um, it's not a valid reason to walk away from faith. I don't mean that from like that experience wasn't valid or what happened wasn't horrible or what happened mm-hmm. shouldn't have happened. Like all of those things are like the, the experience itself is, is totally valid. And at the same time, it isn't a reason to reject Jesus, you know? And I don't mean that in like some kind of heartless way. I'm just like, let's, let's more have like just a black and white conversation about what is true. And that scenario, like a plus B doesn't equal C, you know? And there's very simple analogies that we could use that I don't mean to be um, like dismissive of, of horrible things that people have gone through, but like you don't have a, a bad experience at one restaurant and give up on all restaurants. You don't watch a bad movie and give up on movies. You don't Mm -hmm. like there's, you know, and this idea to say, you know, whatever it was, it was this or this, the one verse that I don't understand, if we're rejecting faith, um, if we're rejecting Christianity for anything outside of who was Jesus, we're rejecting it for the wrong reason, for a reason that ultimately doesn't make sense. And that's, that's what I'm really trying to, even it could be an old Testament verse. I don't understand Noah's flood. I don't understand, you know, whatever it might be. If we're rejecting um, God, forgiveness, salvation, you know, a, a connection, a restored relationship with him off of anything outside of who was the person of Jesus. Um, and, and I, I don't know that I've like yet to meet somebody. Um, I've heard of people that have, I know that it, like there are people out there that have, well, I, I haven't even yet met somebody. I met a whole lot of people that have walked away from church that have had bad church experiences that don't, um, that are not Christians anymore or perhaps never were. Um, but I've yet to meet somebody that's like, I just don't believe that Jesus was God. And that's my, that's my reason. Mm -hmm. Um, and if, and if that's your reason, like totally, that's what you should be making the decision off of Mm -hmm. is who was the person of Jesus. And so that's why I'm trying to get the conversation focused on him because the way you view the old Testament after that, or the way you view people who abuse his words and teachings, like you don't ever evaluate a belief system off of its abuse. Like, you know, we're, the world is full of sinful, broken people. We don't believe that anybody is going to get what he taught perfectly in this life. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I'm trying to get people to, you know, cause so often the pushback has nothing to do with the person of Jesus. And I'm like, can we just get about, yes, like empathy for the experience, empathy for the question. I get that versus confusing too, but like, can we get the conversation back to focus on Jesus? Cause we're just not going to find any common ground until we decide, um, who he is. And yeah. so that's kind of the heart behind that. And I, th- I think a, in a big part, you know, a lot of heart of the series. As you were talking, I was just thinking we, we do this in culture a lot. Like, you know, where we, we might go eat at a restaurant and there's a, a waiter who's having a really bad day mm-hmm. and the restaurant was really highly recommended and it seems super exciting, but that waiter is having a bad day. Yep. And so we have a horrible experience with the waiter. Yep. Um, and then we're like, this restaurant is awful. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Whereas in reality, if we would have had a different waiter or if the manager of the restaurant, who's like passionate about people and the community would have come by mm-hmm. and like tried to fix the experience could have been totally different, but we do, you know, we do that. We, we walk away and we go, like kind of baby out with the bathwater, like right. um, that means the entire thing is bad, right? You know what I mean. And, and and to your point, I think a lot of people maybe go, I don't know if I believe Jesus is the Son of God, mm-hmm. but I've had that bad experience, so I'm not going to find out, right? You know what I mean? Right. I, don't, I don't think people intentionally run from the question, right? But um, seems like the bad experience kind of gives an excuse sometimes, yeah, um, to not deal with it, yeah. A hundred percent. I'm I'm tired of the rules. I'm tired of the hypocrisy. I'm tired of the, you know, the shame. I'm tired of the guilt trip. I'm tired of the, you know, it's not relevant. It's, uh, you know, it's boring. Um, you know, a leader abused their position, you know, whatever it might be. And, um, and all of those are horrible. Like mm-hmm. all of that sucks. And I mean, we take our rules so seriously at trying to minimize that for people. And we know that we're not going to create a great church experience for everybody that walks in the door. You know, and we take yep. that seriously and we try to learn from those and we try to, but gosh, like at the same time, there's just potentially, you could be missing out on everything. Yeah. Um, if we don't consider Jesus for those reasons. So. There's also just a side note too. Like if, if anybody bases their faith um, in Christ, on the church, like, mm-hmm. even if they are a follower of Jesus, they're going to be disappointed. Yeah. You know what I mean? I just, I, I'm... It's not a firm enough foundation. Y- yeah, foundation, yeah. And you know. I had a conversation with a, a friend of mine who used to be a staff member at a church, and 
uh, they just said when they were on staff at a church, they had this person come in and they had them explain uh, that they'd been to all these other churches and they finally found the one and it was great and they were excited. And the friend just said to them, you're probably going to leave. Like, mm. I'm going to be honest. Like, you just haven't found the reason yet. Mm. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they were basing, like, their relationship with Christ on which church found them and, like, satisfied yeah. them the most. Yeah. Um, whereas, like, we got to focus on Jesus. Right. And that goes for us on staff. Yeah. You know, yeah. not just the people, you know, who are listening as well. Too. Right. I've heard, I think uh, it was Buck once that said, like, the, you know, parenting, like, the number one goal of parenting is, like, to transfer your child's trust from you to their heavenly father. Like, that's what I'm ultimately trying to, as a young, they're going to look to you. You're going to be their hero for a season. Can you transfer that trust to their heavenly father? And to a degree, I'm like, I felt like that was applicable to anybody who would say they're a follower of Christ, you know, that maybe they're going to trust you before they trust Jesus because you're their friend, because they have mm -hmm. respect for you. If you have, you know, influence or a stage, like, great. But my, my only hope is that yeah, I'm going to transfer that trust to Jesus because he's the only one who's not going to let you down at some point, you know, yep. Yep. and it's too fragile to put your trust in anything else as a result. So, yep. Yep. but again, to go back to like, I don't want to invalidate any bad church experiences yeah. or anything. And, right. Um, but there is, there's a lot of nuances to it. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, our, our last question uh, is more so honing in on Jesus being an example to the world mm -hmm. and kind of the implications of that for our lives and like our everyday walks. Um, if Jesus was an example to us of perfection, um, how can we be like Jesus if he was perfect and we are not, and we're not going to be? Yeah. It's, yeah. Uh, you know, being like Jesus is kind of an impossible. Or like, why do it? Yeah. Why yeah. go after that goal? Yeah. yeah. Why, why try? Why go after an unattainable goal? It's like, we'll never get there. Yeah. Well, I want to, uh, I think it's a really great question and I'll, I think maybe there'd be a uh, two sides of it. One would be almost more of like, this is just practical, you know, mm -hmm. advice. And then the other is, is maybe more of like a faith inspired side. The practical side would be, um, it, John Acuff's finished book. I mean, it's all about this, right? Like it's, it's the idea that perfection is often like the enemy of getting anything done. Perfection can be the enemy of progress. You know, right. um, I was, you know, on a diet and I had one burger, you know, fast food burger, and I like quit the whole diet, you know, and you're like, wait, that logically, that doesn't make any sense because you still had a whole lot of health to be gained if you had done it 90% of the way or 80% of the right. way, you know, um, but we'll like do that. And it's, and it's like, no, that the one burger, yeah, it wasn't good for your body that day, but if you only eat Big Macs, three meals a day for the rest of your life. We have a documentary on that. Like it doesn't go well for you, yeah, you know, if you yeah. choose to do that. So there's this interesting kind of concept to say like, hey, the pursuit of, even if you don't get it perfect, is going to have a whole lot of benefit for you. And there's grace along the way when you miss the mark. And like, yeah, it's a little weird to acknowledge you're going to miss the mark as you aim for perfection, but it's not a reason not to aim at it. You mm -hmm. know, um, I mean, Paul literally calls us to that. <laughs> like we're called it to, to be perfect as our heavenly father is perfect. So um, I, I think that's like an interesting, um, uh, just kind of like, logical thing that, that we will do or or apply to say there's a whole lot of benefit in the process. But I also think the other thing that I would more like kind of on the face side, like lean into a little bit is what is your reason for trying to be like Jesus? You know, like, mm -hmm. is it to have um, a... Um, a perfect scorecard or a perfect record or perfect behavior or whatever it might be so that you're like finally good enough. Like, do you think you'll finally like just breathe a little deeper when you've like reached perfection or that people will notice it and applaud you for it, that God will like love you a little more? Mm -hmm. Like what's, what's your even reason, you know, for that? And I think there is, um, if your, if your end goal is not about the perfect behavior, but it's about like, I want to know Jesus more than trying to be like him. It's going to teach you a whole lot because as you discover more of how imperfect you are, mm -hmm. your need for grace, your need for a savior, you know, or your awareness of your need for a savior um, are going to increase your respect for what he did and how his life will grow. You'll understand like what went into, you know, more and more the way that he lived his life and why he said what he said. So you're, you're pursuing not perfect behavior, but you're pursuing him in that process and then when you do fail and you invite him into those moments, you discover him more intimately. And so there is this, you know, merging in his direction. There is this, um, you know, intimacy that's forming with him as you pursue that. And I think that 
fullness of life that he speaks of, you know, that kind of wholeness, that complete joy is found in not finally like, man, I got an A plus on the report card this spring. Mm -hmm. Um, but I am more in step and in tune with the spirit. I'm more in step and in tune with Jesus than I've ever been before. And in this place, there is a wholeness. There is a peace. I'm seeing myself differently, God differently, those around me differently. Um, and so that's why I think the pursuit of that, even knowing that you're never going to be perfect. And even when I say that, like, there's all these nuances I want to throw in, you're never going to be perfect in terms of like getting the scorecard, right? You are righteous in terms of like your forgiveness. That's Mm -hmm. the other weird, like nuance of this. Like he's seeing Jesus's rightness, righteousness, not yours when you place your trust in Christ. So like from that perspective, you are white as snow. You are clean. You are forgiven. Your sins are wiped off the slate not because of anything you did, but because of what Jesus already did for you. So it, there's got to be, like, that's not a good reason, in, you know, to try to pursue perfection either. It's really about this pursuit of Jesus um, as you try to pursue um, pursue him. Also, it yeah. wasn't Paul. I just looked that up because I like, try to catch myself as I say what Jesus is saying these words. <laughs> Jesus says, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect in right, right. Matthew 5, 48. So, yeah. um, but anyways, um, I don't know if that, like, gets to the question or, or what I, you might... No, yeah, I think so, too. And I, I think it's important to note that <clears throat> our pursuit of, like, behavior and perfection and morality should never be, like, um, a... Comp- uh, well, how do I say this? A comprehensive pursuit of just that. Like, right. it should be us pursuing Jesus yep. and closeness with him yep. and then him producing those good things in our life that are closer to kind of the perfection that we're, we're going for. And so it's like, uh, I mean, Jesus said it, the, the, the vine and the branch analogy, which was so good. So like we all, we all want to produce fruit per se in our life. We mm-hmm. want, you know, the love, peace, patience, kindness, like the, these good things in our life. Yep. Um, and Jesus says this analogy where he says he's the, the vine mm-hmm. and we're just a branch off of the vine. Mm-hmm. Now the fruit grows on the branch, mm-hmm. but the branch itself cannot produce the fruit if it is disconnected from the the vine. Right. Right. And so, so, I mean, the only way in which we produce the very good things we're going for and we, we go after that behavior per se is if we stay connected to the vine, if we're walking with Jesus, if we're pursuing him, we're staying focused on him. And I think that's something that we lose sight of. We just have this natural kind of gravitational pull towards like white knuckling, being yep. good, I'm going to do better, you know, that kind of thing. And we, we lose sight of that. I mean, Paul, who, who you would argue is the, one of the best Christians of all time. <laughs> he his you know, one of my favorite statements and, and the things he says is, uh, God, your grace is sufficient in my weakness. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's a full recognition of his own brokenness and weakness yeah. and a recognition that God's grace is what gets the work done. Yeah. Not Paul's strength. Right. And I think that's more of, you know, that pursuit of Jesus and watch what he does. And I do agree, you know, we're already righteous. I I had this quote pulled up because we were talking about from Judah Smith. Mm -hmm. He has a book called Jesus Is, and it's a fantastic book if anybody um, is looking for a good book to listen to, especially Mm -hmm. because Judah's voice. I mean, that dude, he chose to be a pastor. He could have been like a voice actor, though. I mean, his voice is amazing. But Jesus Is, it's all about centering on the person of Jesus. And he has this quote that says, I will never be more righteous than I am today. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How tired are we exhausted are we of pursuing righteousness yeah and how often to be re- we need to be reminded that we're already good yeah like if yeah. we put our faith and trust in jesus like we're, we'll never be more righteous than we are today god yeah. says we're white as snow wow. um yeah. just abide in jesus and watch yeah. what he does in you as a result yeah yeah no, that's so powerful and even in the analogy you're giving it's not it's not like you know work harder to be like me, the vine, right? Like the John 15, where that comes from, he says, remain in me Mm -hmm. and I will remain in you for a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine. Like you said, you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. A few verses, he keeps, he keeps the analogy going, but then he like ends it with, I have loved you even as the father has loved me, remain in my love. Right. When you obey my commandments, you may remain in my love. <laughs> right. So there's this like connection with like you're staying in the love, like you're staying connected to him. And yes, your behavior becomes more perfect in that journey <laughs> as a result. But the end goal was was not the perfect behavior. The perfect behavior is a byproduct of, you know, the relationship the remaining of. in Jesus. Yeah. So that's how it's all. I mean, it's confusing and it's not at the same time. You know, there's like the yeah. simplicity to it. Like, yeah. Like don't add all the rules, just like remain in his love, you know, and in that you will love those around you, you know, more perfectly than you ever have before. Yeah. And yeah, that's the, 
I think the end goal of that. Yeah. So. I think it's a good place to wrap up. Uh, we're going to keep asking questions about why did Jesus, um, a lot of them do come from why did he come? And mm-hmm. then there's, there's kind of layers to that question that we're going to continue um, looking at throughout the series. And so um, I know we're, we're, you know, you and Buck are kind of sharing this series. And mm-hmm. so it'll be cool to kind of, you know, flip flop weeks and hear different perspectives and stuff. And so, um, but I'm excited for where we're going next leading up to Easter and we will see everybody for part two this week, either online or in person.